our agenda is I'm going to have uh, Kim introduce herself because she just recently had some changes in job responsibilities and, and I can't even keep up here. So she's going give, to give us the update <laughs> there. And then we're, we're going to talk about adoption uh, aptitude. There's going to be polling here and we'll leave some time for Q&A as well. So, so Kim, let me just uh, have you introduce yourself to the audience and, and, and what you're responsible for at DocuSign. Sure. And thanks, first of all, for help having me. Um, I'm responsible. I'm Group Vice President for Customer Success Americas, which includes really all of your success functions that are involved in helping customers um, really achieve value. I also um, lead globally the, in, the focus around adoption and enablement in terms of how do we ensure globally that all of our services and success teams are consistent in terms of um, the types of adoption programs we put forward. Perfect. Awesome. And I think most importantly is the, is the fact that you have a daughter graduating from college this year. I think that's the most important fact. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. Yes, Friday. <laughs> so so let, let's get into it. I'm going to put a couple slides on the table here just to, to, sure. to set it up for the audience. And so yeah. on, on Monday in, in the opening keynote, we, we talked about these attributes of the have and the, and the have nots. And um, today we're going to double click into adoption aptitude. And, and adoption is something that at, at TSIA we have been talking about for, for years. And, and really, it, it's the proverbial win-win, right? If, if you right. can help a customer successfully adopt and effectively adopt your technology, you know, they're obviously going to spend more money with you, they're going to renew, but they're going to get the business outcomes that they're hoping to get by, by buying your technology. And so uh, over the years, we've created frameworks on how to think about that and then what telemetry you need to be able to drive adoption and really take a customer from what we call low adoption to high adoption to yeah. ultimately effective adoption. And we have a, a whole thread of research around um, the type of telemetry that you use to start driving outcomes et cetera, et cetera. So if you're not familiar with this framing, I really encourage you uh, to, to, to go, you know, click into that body of, of research that's, that's already out there. But let me warm the audience up here with an opening poll. And, and the question that we have is, is, does your company have a defined framework for assessing customer adoption levels? Just a simple yes or no. And, and let's get the same kind of rocking participation we had yesterday, and we'll Kim, we'll see where the data comes yeah. in here as I as I check our our slider results, and as I as I tell everybody, you got to put the cup of coffee down, or if you're eating lunch, uh, put the sandwich down. Let's get some good votes here, and as soon as we see a clear trend, um, I will I will call it out here. Okay, we need more. There we go. There we go. More data. Ooh, the trend is shifting rapidly. <laughs> oh. Whoa, I, this is a big swing. Okay, now it's going back to, this is this is a horse race we have going here. So a uh, majority are saying no. It's about, it's, it's, it's settling right around 60, 40-ish. 60% of the, of the respondents saying no, do they not have a formal adoption framework? About 40% saying yes. And I think we're pretty stable there. So, so Kim, let me ask you this. This, you know, question, you know, when you before we delve into specific capabilities on adoption, you know, aptitude, right. what are some of the distinct uh, opportunities and challenges DocuSign faces on this topic? Because you have companies that range in size from literally one employee up to right. you know folks that have tens of thousands of, of employees. So, so what are some of the some of the challenges there? Well, I think, first of all, um, as a customer first company, DocuSign is looking at how do we ensure that there is really something for every customer, whether to your point, it's one customer or it's a Fortune 50 company or, you know, public sector entity with thousands and thousands of customers. And I think what, what we've learned is, you know, there is no one size. Um, we first need to think about really what are, what are the characteristics and profiles of our customers in different segments? Mm -hmm. And then we took some time to figure out what do they need and how do we do that really at scale so that we do provide something for everyone that's meaningful. We mm -hmm. do that in a way that's scalable, but also that it's meaningful in terms of whether you're a one person or a 50,000 person company, we've provided you with a level of services and capabilities that allow you to achieve the value you're looking for from DocuSign. Yeah. So the challenge is, you know, getting that segmented, getting that organized, and getting that implemented and executed across 
all of those different customer segments. Um, yeah. And the opportunity is for us to do that. And I'll talk more about this. Uh, mm -hmm. Try it, test it, try it, test it, and continue to iterate as we get smarter about all of these different customer segments. But it's possible. We, to your point, we have hundreds of thousands of customers. Um, and our ability to get them all to adopt is, um, it is a challenge, but it's a really great opportunity. And we've seen some amazing results in some of the things that we've done, which we'll talk more about. Yeah, and I think what's interesting, you know, yesterday we talked about the fact this blurring of, of B2B and B2C worlds. And there's a lot of tactics in B2C in terms of, of helping customers adopt technology that really B2B companies could learn from. And I think as we talk today here, you're in a unique position because in some ways you have that entire spectrum. You're not just dealing with massive enterprises. Right. You're right. dealing with folks that you know behave more like consumers. So, so the first capability that you and I talked beforehand that we wanted to talk about was how important it is to have a well-defined customer engagement life cycle. So let's do another quick poll here. Yeah. So we know that it is not a majority practice for people to have a, a clear um, you know, a, adoption framework in general, but does your company have a documented customer life cycle that is actively leveraged by uh, customer facing employees? So let's see where people are on that. And we'll see how the data comes in here on customer engagement life cycle. Starting out encouraging, I can tell you this is a little bit better better than uh, last time, but we had a big swing last time, so we don't know how this is going to, the dust is going to settle here. But we're going to find out, oh, if the gap is closing. Mm, still positive though, still positive. 60, 40-ish, 50, 50, oh, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to call it at around closer to 50, 50. About 50% of the folks saying no, they don't. About 50% of the folks saying yes, they they do. And so let me ask you, Kim, as we talked about this again beforehand, why is a defined customer lifecycle so important from your perspective? Oh, my gosh. It's an imperative. And I would say if you don't do anything else, define the life cycle. And, and I think that comes in multiple dimensions. So I think first is what is the life cycle from pre to pre to post, right, and then through to renewal. Um, <clears throat> and I think what what we found uh, in our experience, and I think was was really one of the secret sauces is as you're defining that, understanding and defining what is happening in each of those segments of your life cycle. So from onboarding to adoption to optimizing, as an example, mm -hmm. what is what is it that um, the customer experiences um, what should they experience ideally and what should be the outcome? And really, if you define the outcome at each gate in the life cycle, it really gives you something to tether onto in terms of whether or not your customers are actually successfully making it through the different gates of the life cycle. Mm -hmm. so that ultimately, when they get to the end, they're in a great position to grow and they're in a great position uh, in terms of value they've achieved. And one of the things we learned in doing these life cycle workshops is that there was a lot of white space in there for some segments mm -hmm. of customers. And it really allowed us to address where we could fill in um, and define better what the outcome should be in each of those life cycle. So, so if I play that back, I mean, yeah. and I think this is critical, right? You're saying it's not good enough just to define yeah. the steps in the life cycle. You have to just, you have to understand the markers of is a customer through, you know, the first phase to the next phase. And if you don't understand those markers, you know, you know and, and find out there's white space that the people aren't making it through that first phase. So, so you really have to <clears throat> have your arms around what it, uh, of where, again, understand, assessing where the customer is in that journey. Right. And, and I think what that allows you to do is once you do that work, it allows you to also understand who's healthy and growing and what other programs, capabilities and services are available to them to keep them growing. They're on a trajectory. That's great. It also helps you uh, in terms of defining when you when you understand what those are, when a customer is unhealthy and yeah. how to get them back on track. Yeah. Uh, just to in, in two examples. So it really also allows you to start um, instrumenting the customer condition and what you can apply to different customer conditions along the continuum. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's talk about a second capability yeah. here. And that, and that is around customer segmentation. And let's see where our audience is on this one. So the, so the next poll we have in play, 
does your company segment customers based on adoption profile? So really building on what you just said, right? Building under understanding where they are, so you understand how how to respond. So let's see where where folks are coming in on on this one, on adoption profiles. <clears throat> oh, this is not starting out good, Kim. I guess this is where we are. I guess the questions we're asking are getting tougher here. Maybe the bar is getting higher. I don't know, but. Um, but let's get the numbers up. Let's get closer to where we were before. I don't want people to get discouraged. It's okay if the answer is no. That, that, that's okay. Um, yeah, this this is a pretty strong. Keep going, folks. Keep going. This is a, a pretty strong signal here. So, um, and, and I'm a little surprised by this. So this is coming out to be about an 80-20 rule, about 78% of the folks saying, no, we, no. we, you know, we don't have this... Um, segmentation. So obviously you think this is a critical, critical approach here. What, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think if I, if I think about understanding the, the customer condition, you'll hear me use that uh, quite a bit is ideally customers come into the, come into the system um, post sale, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to onboard them. We're going to get them started. And ideally, first and foremost, as soon as possible, get them up and running on, on the platform. From there, right, ideally they're gonna grow, um, continue to increase the number of features, capabilities, they're gonna expand their user base, whatever your particular variables are to measure adoption. What is important is to understand what makes a healthy adopting customer versus an unhealthy. And I think yep. that's important because otherwise it's really challenging to know what to apply, especially at right. scale when you're trying to yeah. do large programs. So I think if, if, if people were to leave here and I was to say, you know, it, it can seem, a lot of these things too can seem daunting, Thomas. And I would say start simple is I would say, first and foremost is understand your customer conditions right now, do a control. What, what, what can you learn and what kind of data? And we'll talk about data more in a little bit, but what kind of data do you have on your customer condition today? What, mm -hmm. what is it telling you? Um, and there will be correlations to certain things your best customers do. And then how do you think about that in terms of capabilities and services you can offer? Uh, and then how do you implement that in an operational way so that you can start to do that um, at scale? But you first have to understand what makes a customer um, successful, what are they using? How are they using its behavior, its data, its, um, its, its adoption of feature function? Um, but beyond that is then what do you do with that is the critical thing. So you have to understand that first and then you can start to build out the programs. I think sometimes myself included, you think you know and you go build. I mean, you do, you know, I think you, you have to do a little bit of both because you have to have things available to your customers. But ideally, sometimes you have to slow down to go fast in terms of really understanding what you're solving for um, in your customer base as it relates to adoption. And I'm not sure we're always clear on that. Yeah, and I, and I think that when it comes to segmenting customers with adoption profiles, and, and I, I have to tell you, I am a little stunned that that you know the 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 numbers came out that way because again, we've been talking about this for for year for years now, right? Yeah. And, and I do th I do think people say, well, look, I, I just don't have the telemetry. I I, I just don't know. And, and I think that there's you know at least three different ways you could pick this stick up. One is what you put on the table is look, understand what telemetry you do have on your customer. That's one thing yeah. to start looking at. Right? Yeah. What do we know or not know? I think there's a, there, another way you can pick the stick up is, well, what do other companies look at to understand the difference between low and high and effective? Um, there, you know, we can learn from others, right? So you can start to, to frame that in. And I think the third is just, I think all of us, if we sat down with our best service people and our best sales people, you know, our best account facing people, product people as well, you could say, well, well, what does a highly adopted, <laughs> healthy customer look like, right? That's what right. are those attributes? Yeah. And you could start to frame that in and start to say, well, gosh, we probably already know at a rough level, you know, we could start segmenting, well, these customers are, are pretty healthy. You know, we know this, you know, and these are not, right? And the, but, but just that base level of segmentation allows you to start approaching those customers differently. And, and, and you're spot on in terms of, you know, I, I use the word blunt instrument sometimes that uh, when we're talking is but just let's look at the blunt instrument to start yeah. and let's see what it tells us and let's leverage that and then learn from that. Yeah. Um, because I think what can happen to all of us is we can get overwhelmed with 
all of the data we want, you know, our minds immediately associate, uh, you know, with the data and then want more. Um, and we start asking more questions and it can get complex really quickly. My guidance and, and what we did, and I think it worked out really well was we said, let's just go get some fundamental um, information about our customers, both our, 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 um, our uh, lower end customers. And what I mean by that is the, the, the thousands of customers, we'll do that at scale and, and kind of a, a group uh, cohort analysis. And then to your point, exactly, in the higher end, um, where we have more of a customer success management motion, working with our sales teams and so forth, is let's go talk to our customers. Let's gather survey information. And in both, in both of those, um, let's, let's see what, what the initial information tells right. us. Right. And let's use that. Um, and let's make, a, you know, uh, let's make somebody very wise said to me, make a hypothesis. And mm -hmm. so you make a couple of hypotheses and go after them and then see what that actually proves out and yep. um and then and then iterate from there it's all about iteration and learning as you go sophistication will come over time um but start somewhere absolutely and and and, and it's important to to do this segmentation and these adoption profiles because it comes to this next polling question which is you know does your company have different documented adoption playbooks for different sized customers and really, you know, not only size customers, but ultimately, you know, customers that are in different places in the adoption journey. Because, you know, I think this this can't be a blunt instrument, right? You can't basically say, look, you know, we're going to go work on adoption on everybody the same way. Right. <laughs> because they're in very different places. I mean, and some folks are already highly adopted and they're pretty self-sufficient. Others are not. And so, um, it, it is, it, you know, you, you will not use your, your finite precious resources wisely if you don't, you know, have that segmentation and then adjust the approach based on where these customers are are coming out. So, so this data, n not surprisingly, based on the previous poll, is coming pretty close. It's about 70-30, um, so a little bit better here, but about 73% of the folks saying no, they don't have different adoption playbooks for different size customers, about 30% saying saying yes so so t tell me how you approach this in terms of you know your really complex customers versus maybe simple or you know customers that are struggling what's yeah what, what's your philosophy there right so it's part of the research we did which we were just talking about was we learned a lot about our customers those that were doing extraordinarily well and those that um that were not and for various reasons and we started to put together playbooks that our teams could use um, that would allow them to really um, put forward a, the right set of, of, of options, whether it be relation, like the relationships, a, a relationship playbook. So um, we don't have um, broad or senior relationships in, our, in, in the company, and that's a critical success factor as an example. And so what is the process and what's the playbook for that? Just as an example, another might be um, they're only using minimal features. It's not a really sticky use case. How do we get them evolved and using more? Um, there's a business case for it. They just don't seem ready. What could I do? And, and there's a playbook for how to help customers, recommendations, programs uh, that, you know, as an example, a CSM could use uh, to work with that customer. At the, at the scale end of that, we look at cohorts and we look at conditions in the cohorts and then our team applies different um, online programs. Uh, there are common, it's really an omni-channel. It's a combination of um, outreach through um, emails and mm -hmm. it's web and it's community. And it's really trying to take customers um, through the different channels that are available um, in self-service based on their conditions. And so we've got behavioral and data, um, uh, feature data, uh, usage data, and we use that to apply to the playbooks or the processes we take our at scale through, um, and those are much more automated, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, th th this concept of of really running the, the right play at the right time with with That's the customer right. is is you know is a critical concept because again, I mean, what what I see. You, you know, and we have this concept now of, of dy dynamic engagement models, right? So, so, and let's take this scale, right? Let's go go to, to to your large customers, strategic customers. Even within those customers, it can't be a blunt instrument, right? Because you may have a, a, a large customer that again is doing very well, 
They're they're very you know they've you're doing all the right use cases, et cetera, et cetera. Do you need to you know to be all over them? No, <laughs> but you may have another large customer That's right. who like who like you said you know there's some critical use cases they could be getting a lot more business value from they're not on. You might say, look, I'm going to get a CSM and maybe I need you know more of a technical person involved and we're going to really go love on that customer and help them understand the value here. And so, but but again, if you, you know, if you don't have you know, the understanding of where the customer is and you don't realize I should be running different plays based on where they are, then it's just this, you know, blunt instrument. I just, you know, I'm a CSM, I have eight accounts or 10 accounts or 50 accounts, and I'm just kind of going through and running my, you know, standard touch points with them. That's, you know, that's an okay model. It's not an optimized model. Right. And I, I think with the playbook, what what's what we've learned about the playbook is, um, it's a map and it, yeah. it, it provides directionally. Here are things we know when we see these conditions have proven out the efficacy of the things we applied when we saw these conditions. And as a professional CSM who knows your customer, understands the environment and the situation, you're going to apply your, you know, you know, your secret sauce to that. So it's really in the high end, a combination of providing directionally, here are things we know are working, Here, here's the um, the plan or the map that you can use to walk the, the success track with your customer. And also you've got so much experience and other customers um, apply that with it. And the yeah. combination of the two really yeah. is that is that secret sauce. Yep, absolutely. So let's move on to another critical sure. capability here related to adoption attitude. And that is this relationship between between customer success and the product team, this really what you know what what needs to be a virtuous <laughs> cycle, right? So uh, let's ask folks, yeah. how would you rate the handshake between your customer success teams and your product teams? Poor, fair, or or awesome? And so um, let's see where folks come in on this one. Um, Okay, but boy, people jumped on this one. I think I think there's <laughs> people have people wanted to click really in on this. All right, hit the clicker, <laughs> folks. Let's get some more in on this. Um, though it's uh, well, this is yeah, this is not surprising in a, in a sense. So, so uh, most folks are coming in about fifty six percent of the folks, fifty seven saying fair. You know that you know so so that's good. But but less than, you know four percent are saying awesome. 4% are saying, you know, 5% out of it, we've really got this, you know, super tight um, r relationship. So, so it's sort of meh, you know, in terms of the handshake, right? So, so what, tell me, you know, y your perspective again on, on, on how important this is and, and how can you make this better? I, you know, first of all, I would put us in the awesome category. We've got an incredible engineering and product team at DocuSign and we, um, we have found that being integrated with product, um, you know, I'm a member of the voting product lifecycle committee with our head of, of engineering, our chief technology team. Um, and uh, that has been an incredible opportunity for us from success to have a voice in product launch, um, product feature edition, and so forth. So we have a seat at the table. And I, I would say, that would be one of the, the key pillars um, in terms of your go forward is how do you get a seat at the table with your engineering and product teams and develop Definitely. relationships? And then secondly, another great thing we're doing is we're aligning on goals, adoption goals together. So uh, I'm working with one of the senior product leaders um, in the product organization and his team and our team have put together a joint adoption initiative around a certain set of features and outcomes we're trying to achieve with our customers. And that has been remarkable in terms of the, um, you know, the way in which we're working together, how we're thinking about the customer and really the benefits to the customer and, um, going forward. And that's a, what's the output of that is a couple of different things is um, the more we can keep our customer in the product, right? And help them adopt in the product. So we're looking at you know, in product adoption technology and we're looking at how do we augment that and support that through some of the success channels we have. And that combination is, is, is super powerful in terms of what the customer is able to achieve um, from, from, from the product and the platform. 
So let me ask this question because one of the things, so Laura Fay on our team does a lot of work with product management teams and really trying to, to get to instill you know, with them, the, the importance of adoption and this 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 life cycle, right? Of hey, once you have a product, a feature, and you throw it out there into the wild, you know, it's really not success unless it gets adopted. And and if you think about the, the you know so, sort of the legacy of tech companies, that's really not in our DNA to, to to be overly fixated on adoption. And I'm just wondering the fact that you know you have the seat at the table and you're collaborating with the product teams around adoption. Is it do you believe because of the do, the nature of the DocuSign product? that you, you sort of live and die by adoption. You know, that's the nature of your, and so you get more mind share with the product teams or was that a journey to kind of get them to care more about adoption? I, I think it's a combination of things. I think you're always on a journey um, to further relationship and connection and, and, and integration uh, from from different teams. I think mm -hmm. that's always there. Um, I think I, I'll just I'm just going to put a plug in. I think we have an incredible product and engineering organization who, who really got it from 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 the time I joined, which was adoption feature adoption. So you didn't have to go climb that hill with them. Not 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 really. I think yeah. where we um, where we evolved was really the 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 cadence around engagement and formalizing mm -hmm. that so it's one thing to say i'm going to go to some product meetings and i'm going to give customer successes feedback or i'm going to do um a listening session with some customer success managers and some professional services members it's another thing to be integrated into the motion of a product life cycle um, product innovation meetings and then um, ideally having joint initiatives. And so it's an evolution uh, mm -hmm. to get there, um, but it goes well beyond, I think, what, what perhaps was a, a little bit more of a, a, an informal process. Yeah, interesting. Well, you know, this handshake with the product team is so, so important to get the mind share. And part of it is because, you know, they own the roadmap to telemetry, right, and analytics. <laughs> and if, if they don't care about adoption or they're not prioritizing that, um, then you know you you end up sort of flying blind, right? Uh, you know, trying to really drive the adoption. So the next poll here, let's see how would you describe your customer analytic capabilities, right? No meaningful customer telemetry, some customer telemetry, but but nascent analytics, or you know we, we really leverage advanced customer analytics. Let's see where where po folks are coming in on this one here. Um, and again, I, I have seen that you know it's hard to really make customer telemetry and analytics sing if you don't have the product team you know really you know motivated for that as well. That really is true, you know a true partnership that has to occur. Um, well, uh, here's good news. Here's good news. <laughs> Got some good news in this data. So so right now, only about ten percent, less than ten percent of the folks are saying. Um, Oh no, it's jumped. I'm no, sorry, 13. But no meaningful um, customer analytics. So that's a small, relatively small percentage. So that's good. People people are getting um, better at that. But also, it's, it's a small percentage of folks, uh, 13, 14 percent, that really leverage advanced analytics. So the vast majority of people, about 70 percent, this is pretty steady now, have you know some customer telemetry, telemetry, but nascent customer. Analytics. So, so tell me a little bit about how you leverage the telemetry and the analytics to better to better serve customers. Yeah, sure. I think first is I think to your point, Thomas, is we have a great partnership with product um, and access to to data from product, but we also have access to other types of data, and we combine all of this um, through our our customer success analytics team. So we mm -hmm. have a dedicated team, dedicated team. that yeah. works really closely with us as the business, but also with product. Um, and and is, that, is that one team that serves multiple stakeholders there? I mean, sort of they're the go-to for these customer analytics, so whether the product team has some questions or customer success has questions. How, how do you people, how do you structure that resource? Yeah, they, they're primarily focused in customer success, but they've become so good at what they do and invaluable that, you know, they get pulled in, they're working across the company. Mm -hmm. So they're primarily focused on working with us, but they're, you know, it, you can imagine a healthy customer signs about a customer is going to be important to marketing. It's going to be important to products. So they're, they work cross-functionally, but dedicated to us. 
Well, the, the, and the reason I, I just uh, ask that is, is you know, our, our belief is there needs to be one source of truth, right, around these customer analytics. And if you have two, if you have every department, you know, like you know, there's obviously things that are specific to marketing analytics, but but if marketing's like, I'm going to go figure out customer analytics and product team says, I'm going to go figure out customer analytics, and customer success says, says the same thing. And it's like, well, wait, you know, A, it's, you know, duplicating resources, but then you start to get into this, well, well what are the, what's the data really saying? Yeah. Where's the source of truth? A hundred percent. And, and and we've got to that point, we've got collective teams. We have marketing product and success working together on customer insights together. Yeah. Um, and we leverage the customer insights in different ways yeah. uh, for different reasons. And so then the success analytics team really takes back and we leverage that data from our perspective and for our needs. Yeah. Marketing will use it for their needs, right? As well, right. And then there is a convergence, which is really powerful between the different organizations as we look at it holistically as well yeah. and the connective tissue that we all have within the, the larger organization. Yeah. So to, tell me a little bit. So one question we get get a lot, and, and Jeremy Deltese on our team uh, who leads our analytics team, you know, gets this question from members a lot in terms of, well, gosh, how do I establish in analytics capability, I mean, who you know, who should I be hiring? Am I hiring data analysts? Am I hiring, you know, how do I get this thing going? What what have what have you seen, you know, works to get to basically stand up that capability? Yeah, we you know, first and foremost is we we have a leader who has um, typically a data science, data data analytics background mm -hmm. um, to help establish the framework of 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 the analytics organization and, and how it would operate, how to think about it. And then within that are your analysts and your data scientists. And yeah. that's a secret sauce because you can have data scientists um, or you can have analysts. Analysts, yeah. If you don't have them both, really they're, imp they're, they're critical yeah. together. They're like peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, you put them together and then they work with the, the business, right? Yep. So the analyst understands our business we outline our requirements. They really interpret that and work with the, the data scientist to then yep. convert that into something um, that is useful for us in terms of, of the, the business side. Yep. And, the, and then the analyst is helping us look at the insights. Yep. So they have that secret, that secret skill of, um, you know, Kim, when this came back, you know, you were looking for this, but you know what came up that was really interesting is this. I yep. was like, oh, we weren't even expecting that. Yeah. So the combination thereof. Yeah, um, has proven to be really invaluable. Well, you know, I, I I'm so glad you put that structure on the table because that is exactly, and I do mean exactly, how we structure our analytics team between these analysts and data scientists, and like you said, peanut butter and jelly, different perspectives, different passions, mm -hmm. right, and different value that they're adding mm -hmm. around uh, around the data. But it, but it's really having you know both those skill sets in play <laughs> if yeah, you want to be serious about this right. function. Right. And then you're, and then you're, and you're right. You need a leader who understands both sides of, of that equation. So, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I personally can't vouch enough for the value of a, of a good customer analytics team that really, you know, can understand the data and help everybody else in the organization. It's worth its weight in gold. And, um, and I know that sometimes those resources are hard to find, but, you know, companies that I still talk to to this day, they're like, yeah, we're, you know, we're not really invested there yet. I just, I, I, I I, I, I can't agree it. more. I have taken headcount in my experiences. You know, uh, I have taken headcount and moved them to analytics yeah. because it's, it's, at the yeah, end absolutely. of the day, the multiplier effect. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, if you want to talk about scale, if you want to yeah. talk about insights, playbooks, anything we talked about, yeah. um, one of the pillars is is the analytics uh, yeah. function. They're imperative. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, there's there's one more question before we go to Q and I want I want to yeah. get to here, and that is, can you mm -hmm. you you mentioned this earlier in the conversation about sort of the omni the omni channel experience and, and leveraging multiple channels, including communities, to really help customers, you know, based on size and complexity, et cetera. So tell me why you're such a such a fan of of, of that approach. I think first you have to meet the customer where they are, and mm -hmm. those customers are going to they're they're everywhere in terms yep. of how they want to consume, how they want to in, engage. And so I, I once heard somebody said, nobody's as smart as everybody. So if we can find ways to leverage um, web property, um, 
you know, email campaigns, self-service. We have something called a knowledge market and our communities, as well as a myriad of other things. But if we bring them together in a holistic way that allows the customer to choose uh, in a frictionless way, um, what works best for them when they need it, mm -hmm. I think then we've reached, you know, a, a really great point in terms of our ability to provide success yeah. to all of our customers. So the omni-channel really allows us to address customers where they are. It also allows us to reach them in multiple ways. So one of the things we talk about all the time is back when I was in, in graduate school, you know, I remember a professor saying five touches and some, but it's, it'll stick, but that was before mm -hmm. any, anything we know. There's a long time ago, Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> Today, it's, it's a really long time ago. Um, I remember they were like, you'll be able to order a TV, uh, a pizza off your TV. And I was like, what are you talking what? about? So that's how far back we go. Um, that being said, I think it's now 10, 15, the noise in the system. So if, if I put my, myself in the, in the shoes of one of our customers, how do I ensure that I get the communication out in a way that sticks, that I make visible in a way that sticks, the resources that are available to those hundreds of thousands of customers that aren't necessarily going to get a customer success manager, but are still looking to achieve specific outcomes from the platform that they're using from DocuSign. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. I mean, I think you gotta meet, you know, meet people where they are and, and helping them adopt here. Kim, thank you so much for the- Thank you. The dialogue and, and, the, and, and thanks so much folks for the great questions that came in here. There's a lot of good ones that came in here and participating in our polls. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great morning and afternoon, everybody.